been thinking about change this week. That may sound like an odd thing to be thinking about. Change has been on my mind probably because of the hurricane. You may be thinking, okay, Pastor, you really got to tie it together now. I'm lost. <laughs> on Wednesday, September 16th, Hurricane Sally slammed into Gulf Shores, Alabama, right? You're familiar with that? And you probably have seen the reports of the devastation done. Unbelievable flooding. Unbelievable rainfall. Power still out. Thousands. A radical shift. And I'm sure as businesses are struggling, Families are struggling. Individuals are struggling. There are probably quite a few right now. Well, first responders, think of all the people that are struggling just in the Pensacola area where the flooding was so bad. I imagine there are quite a few of those folks right now in the uphill battles that they're facing. I would imagine there are quite a few that are feeling the effects of chains feeling all the weight, feeling the limitations. A lot of struggle this week. Not new to us, of course, in 2020, someone recently said, one of my friends here, wow, this is the year 2020, right? What else is gonna happen? Nothing seems to surprise us now. So I'll come back to the chain story in just a minute, but, but in my thinking about the hurricane and thinking about what we've been studying, working our way through Acts and the challenges those first apostles faced, thinking about the chains that they carried, figuratively as well as metaphorically, right? or literally, just the, the challenges, the weight that they were carrying. And I got to tell you, I can't get past a verse we talked about last week. So I invite you to open up your Bible, if you have it with you this morning, and turn to Acts chapter 5, and at the very end. This is after, of course, the, the dual arrests of the apostles, the religious leaders, the, the people with such power had called in Peter and the others who had been teaching and preaching the name of Jesus and they locked them up and they threatened them repeatedly. The Spirit had already released them. They'd gone back into the temple to teach again. Infuriated, frustrated, really beyond comprehension, the religious leaders send the guards back out to, to arrest them again. They drag them back before them. They're put outside so that one of the leaders can, can address the decision, the decision making. As these religious leaders are so mad they are so infuriated and frustrated, they're ready to kill the apostles. And one with a cooler head, we spoke about last week, Gamaliel steps up, you know, and he says, wait a minute, just wait a minute. If this is of them, it won't last. It may flame up and, and cause a ruckus, but it will flame out. Let it go. Because if it's from God, you won't stop it. And not only will you not stop it, you in fact may find yourself fighting against God. You yourself fighting against God. I pick it up in Acts 5, 38, where he says to them in concluding his argument, so my advice is leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted his advice. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. 
Now, a lot of translations say beaten, but the implication is probably flogged. And I'm sure you have heard before in probably sermons around Holy Week, leading up to Good Friday, you've probably heard sermons on flogging. It's spoken of in Deuteronomy 25 for the first time, but Paul comes back and speaks of it in 2 Corinthians as well when he talks about flogging and how many times Paul the apostle had been flogged. But prior to that, the idea of flogging was to receive the lashes that would just rip your skin, rip your body apart. And they were instructed to give only up to 39 because apparently 40 would kill you. And in fact, 39 killed many. It was not just, and they received a beating. That verse hits me because I think of the chains that the apostles carried. We celebrate the apostles. We talk about how exciting it was for them. We talk about the fact that the Spirit, God poured His Spirit into those first apostles. And they spoke in languages they'd never learned. They had a huge impact. The ministry was growing like crazy. What excitement. But imagine the chains that they also carried. You see, Jesus had told them this was coming. You have to go back in Luke. And a part that we really didn't cover when we were going through the, the first part of Luke. Jesus began to talk to them about the coming of the kingdom. And at the end of verse seven, or chapter 17, Luke 17, about halfway through it, I guess, when he's speaking of it, he says, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. See, as he'd been talking about it, they wondered. They wanted to know, when is this kingdom coming? Imagine a lot of us have been asking that in 2020. Lord, when is your kingdom coming? When are you coming to get us out of this mess? Perhaps there are those in Pensacola right now saying, Lord, help. We are up to here, literally in water. But he said it isn't a place or a time. The kingdom you'll know because it'll be among you. And in fact, it already was among them. They talked more about what it would be like and he told of the difficulties that would be coming. Lots of difficulties. Earthly difficulties that you could see and experience. Earthquakes, fires, famines. Issues between people. Nations warring against nations. A lot of things that we've been experiencing these days, enough that I've had several in our church alone ask me, hey, Reed, okay, I mean, I know people talk about this, and hey, yeah, I know about all the prophecy, and people always wonder, you know, but, but do you think maybe this time it's real? Do you think maybe, maybe this really, we are leading up to the end? Maybe, maybe this really is it? I had someone else ask me just recently about the, the Abraham Accords that were just signed between Israel and Bahrain and Qatar. Do you think that's a part of it? Logical questions. I mean, anybody that studied might wonder. Peace is, you know, in one interpretation. Peace is coming to the Middle East. Is this a part of the end? You look a little bit more, maybe even if you've just been listening and, and watching as they further discuss the implications of the Abraham Accords, Abraham Accords, you, re you realize that no, this is probably not so much peace as it is business arrangements. Nevertheless, the questions have been occurring. What's going to happen? And in the midst of all the natural phenomena that are occurring, I think on top of that, what we've experienced in 2020 in this country has made a lot of people wonder. Jesus said, after telling about the coming of the kingdom in Luke, beginning of chapter 18, he told the story, you know, of the, the widow 
that persisted in her prayer. He was telling that story to the disciples because he said they should always pray and never give up. Always pray and never give up. But it's a little tough to pray when you've been beaten and beaten and beaten, isn't it? I mean, sometimes when you begin to wonder and there just continues to be things piling on, you, you, you reach a point where maybe the words are short. Maybe, maybe you're praying. Maybe you haven't given up your belief, but you struggle to find the words. What do I ask for? Lord, I feel like I've been asking over and over and over. And yet the chains persist. They hang on us. They hold us down. Their weight is heavy. What do I do? I'm ringing in the back of our ears. I know I should pray. I come back over in our story in Acts. And in fact, I haven't even gotten to the verse that I can't let go of. It's at the very end of Acts chapter 5. But right before it again, I think of these guys being faithful and and, and sharing, not, not out of obedience, just, just a, a going through an awful task, but sharing the good news. Wanting to tell people, I mean, they may, they walked with Him, they lived with Him, and now He's been resurrected. Good news to share with people. And all that they had been through, all the opposition, and like I said, not just mild beatings, fierce opposition. And again, it wasn't, it wasn't totally unheard of. Jesus had told them in, in Luke 21. He said, look, before all of this happens, all those big bad things that were going to happen, the earthquakes and the kingdom's warding, you yourself will be persecuted. You'll be dragged into synagogues and prisons. I'm in verse 12 of Luke 21 if you're following. You'll be dragged into synagogues and prisons and you'll stand trial before the kings and governors because you're my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you. I'll give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. This had to be going through the apostles' minds as that's actually occurring. And they're standing up and with wisdom they're speaking. And the learned leaders can't refute them. And the people are responding and flocking to them. And there's apparently nothing these guys can do, the leadership, to stop them. They had to have been remembering. Jesus told us this was going to happen. And He told us not to worry because He'd give us the words. How would He give us the words? He'd give us the words through the Holy Spirit. And it's happening. All these things He said were going to happen, they're happening. We're living them out. And so we find ourselves wondering today, some do, where's it all leading? Where's it all headed? What in the world is going to happen in these next several months before 2020 ends? And then what about 2021? Is it going to get any better? Surely you've been a part of conversations, even if you've just been listening or reading about them, that pe many people are saying, man, this is going to have influence. Lasting influence. Everything's changed. And we're likely not going back to what was normal. I mean, there'll be a new normal, of course, but, but radical changes across business and education and even the church. So many are saying right now, this may not change. This, this new way of doing church, what is it going to lead to? And then we talk about the things we pray for when we gather together, right? The concerns we bring up, the illnesses, the loss of employment, all the different things that are happening. And I can't get off my mind the chains that we're carrying. And I realized because a good friend told me not long ago, hey, read it would be really helpful if you use like object lessons or something. You know, so things to help us to, to relate, to catch it. So I invite Dylan to come up because I brought her an object lesson this morning. 
and I'm going to get him to help me with it because I don't think I can handle this mic all at the same time. And as you watch what Dylan does, I want you to keep in mind in a very real way that all of us are carrying chains in our bodies, in our minds, in our emotions. And they just keep getting piled on. It's what we're asked to carry. Sometimes we're not asked, it's just put on us. And I wonder if this morning you can identify with some of the chains. What kind of chains do we carry? You know, I talked about the hurricane earlier, and you may be wondering, well, well okay, was that just about the difficulties and the stuff that's going to happen? And I mentioned specifically a date and a time, or a, a, a day and a time, date, let me get this right, September 16th, 2020. It stood out in my mind when it occurred because of 16 years earlier. And some of those people who were just all caught up in the numbers, you know, they're like, wow, September 16, 2020. And that was, that was 16 years after September 16, 2004, which is when Hurricane Ivan hit and made landfall almost exactly at the same place in Gulf Shores, just a number of miles apart. And it had real meaning to me because at the time we were living in Montgomery, Alabama, and Hurricane Ivan took a little different path than Sally and headed a little bit more north and came right through Montgomery. Now, we'd only been there a few months. We had just moved there, and we were learning the landscape and the culture, a lot of different things about the area, and this hurricane came through. And that's the first hurricane I've ever been through. And Guys, Montgomery, man, that's driving time, three hours inland. And Ivan came through with 90 mile an hour winds. And uh, we had flooding, and there was all kinds of stuff going on. And, and as the rain was coming down, Ann and I had two German shepherds at the time, and we had them indoors because we didn't know what all was going to happen, and one of them in particular didn't take too well to thunder. Not in a run and hide, but in, in an attack mode, and we were trying to keep her from attacking the doors and windows to get at it. But inevitably, you know what happens when the rain's coming down? Dogs have to go outside. But the water was coming up. And the dogs didn't really want to go outside. And I found myself leashing the one to take her out. With the water coming up, we had just a little bit of elevation at the front door and a bed right next to it that was raised enough. And I thought, maybe I can get her to just stick all four calls in the bed and go do her business. And so I opened up the door and I could see the water all over the place. Uh, I thought, okay, here we go. Lord, help her just to go. You know, we got to get this done. And she did. And in just the seconds that it took for that to happen, standing there holding the leash, looking straight out in front of me, not more than probably 15, 20 feet, in a tiny window of time, I watched our 40-foot poplar tree come down. Amazingly, straight in front of me it fell the other direction, and it landed before hitting the house across the street. There were cars and driveways it was not tall enough to have actually damaged the house over there very much. But had it come back to me standing there holding, and I'm telling you, it went down like that. It would have come right through the house. And the matter of time that it went down, there would have been no running. I remember that so well because, well, 
Well, after a tree falls, you have to remove it, right? <laughs> Trees were down everywhere. It was going to be a while before anybody came to our little back of the woods and they grew it. So, with a nice little small truck and a lot of naivety, I said, oh, well, i got to get a chain to get this tree out of the way. And that's where this chain came from. I'll spare you the story. But to tell you that it wasn't such a great idea. The chain worked, the truck didn't. But the chain stayed with me. It's a heavy chain. It's a heavy duty chain. And I decided I might need it again sometime. And I carry it in the back of my truck now. Just in case somebody else needs it. But on a day like today, as we reflect on this passage and the struggles that the apostles went through and the challenges that so many of us are dealing with, and they just keep piling on, I think of the different chains that we wear. I think of, I think of, well, the chain I just told you about is a chain of assistance, right? We use a chain, sometimes chains can be a good thing, and we use them to, to assist us. That's not normally the way we think of chains. The songs we just sang, they're not about helpful chains. They're about chains of fear. They're about changes, chains of, of angst. They're about change, uh, chains of distress. They're about chains of anticipatory grief. And then actual grief. They may be chains of, after piling on and on and on, of despair and despondency. And I wonder, as you look at this chain wrapped around me, I wonder what chains are hanging around you today. I wonder what chains maybe you're in touch with as you think about your own struggle. And I wonder about the weight that it has on your being. What are we to do about these chains? Many are saying right now, I don't know how to get them off. That's not actually what they're saying, but they're saying, I don't know what to do. I, I, man, what, we, just seem, we just seem under it. When are we going to get out from under it? And a lot of the things we used to rely on are gone. What do we do? Is there a way to not only get rid of the chains, but is there a way to flourish? Is there a way to, to be happy again? Is there a way? And you say, well, well, yeah, sure. If you've been paying attention to what's going on just in our church family, you know some good things are coming, right? We've had four guys in the last seven to ten days get new jobs. And we celebrate that. We praise the Lord for that. And some of them are actually even reporting, not only have I gotten rid of the chain of unemployment off of me, this is better than it was before. God has actually helped me use this opportunity to step into something that maybe I never would have done before. But I want you to take it a step further this morning. I want you to take it a step beyond. And I don't mean to minimize these things because they're good and we celebrate them. But, but there's still a lot of people that are suffering and struggling. And some of the things that we're struggling under are much bigger than we are. Some of the things that are happening in our culture. Some of the things in our country that are happening around us. Some of the things that have happened to us that aren't so easily overcome. And that sounds really minimal for me to stand here and say that for one of you guys who was out of work. Make it sound like, oh, that was easy just to get another job, right, Pastor? Not so easy. But there are things beyond that. There are things that are not so easily overcome. And we're still wearing those chains. And now I take you back to our passage today in Acts. 
the verse that I can't get rid of. After they were flogged, after they were then ordered never again to speak in the name of Jesus, the apostles left them in verse 41, Acts 5, 41. The apostles left the high council rejoicing. Rejoicing. That God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Friends, who does this? I mean, really. Who rejoices when you've been punished in such a way? Who rejoices when you've been threatened by people who have the ability to carry it out? Who rejoices, even though we speak of the fact that we should as Christians rejoice when we suffer for His name? Do we rejoice? Do you celebrate the things that are causing you to question? Do you celebrate the challenges you face when you're trying to figure out how to pray? Do you celebrate the suffering that those around us are experiencing? When everyone's wondering what's next? It is a challenge. It's a challenge for me. And I confess to you that as I've been reading this and wondering, If I was so persecuted, would I rejoice? Would I rejoice at the suffering because I've been counted worthy of experiencing what Jesus experienced? Suffering for His cause, His kingdom, the kingdom He said would bring about these things as the kingdom of darkness warred against us. As you struggle to regain employment, as you struggle to overcome chronic health diseases and ailments, as you struggle with isolation, as you struggle to figure out what to do with the kids in school and the computers all day long, as you struggle to figure out how are we ever going to get back to where we were, what does it look like? And the chains just keep hanging on. Do we rejoice? Because in our own way, these are opportunities. <coughs> these are opportunities to suffer for the kingdom of God by telling others He has not given up on us. He has not lost His power. He has not changed in His ways of bringing about good. We must be faithful. We must hang on. We must continue to share hope with others. We cannot let these chains weigh us down. It doesn't diminish the weight of the chains. So I ask you again, very sincerely, friends, what are we to do with the very real chains that weigh upon us? What do we do with the weight that just keeps hanging on. What do we do for our friends or maybe those we don't even know that are dealing with heavy chains? The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and beyond, from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. And if you find yourself thinking, I know, Pastor, you told us that last week. This sounds a lot like the same kind of ending. Then you probably think also like I have thought many times. This is the same message. And so I wonder, has the message itself become a chain? Does the message just kind of hang on to you now? And it doesn't really influence you for good? What are we to do with the chains that hang? 
What are we to do with the message that maybe sounds like an old message? How is this to become real, genuine hope for you and for me and for those beyond our family and our friends, those outside the walls of the church? Do we have any good news, really? Or do we simply encourage people like we've tried to encourage in the past? Well, I'm telling you, if you'll follow Jesus, if you'll just give your life to Him, it'll be better. <coughs> Friends, we're dealing with an opportunity like we've never had. In our own country, we don't have to go on foreign missions in our own country to demonstrate the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I ask you today, what chains are you carrying that keep you from doing that? Are they chains of disbelief? Are they chains of doubt? Are they chains of, of not fully understanding? Are they chains of of getting it mentally but not experiencing it? What are the chains that keep us, the church, from releasing and sharing with joy and rejoicing the greatest news ever that just keeps going? What keeps us? What chains bind us or weigh us down from sharing this good news? demonstrating the joy in which we live. Because I want to tell you, if you haven't experienced it recently, when you become real with Him, and He becomes real with you, when you begin to pray to Him regularly from the depths of your being, with all the doubts or wonders or worries or weights or anger or frustration or whatever else you take to Him, when you begin to talk to Him with these things in a very real way and you cry out from your being, God, come and make a difference in my life. Make your good news real in me. If these men that were just men like you and me, just people, if these men with the same spirit in them could have had such a radical change in their life, a radical change because the chains were released, the chains were broken and carted away, what's stopping us from experiencing the same thing? Jesus said, after telling of the coming of the kingdom, pray always and never give up. Never give up. And even when we doubt, we can remember that Jesus said to one of his dearest disciples, a man with fire and passion and muscle. I'll follow you to the end, Lord. Luke twenty two thirty three. Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. And Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny me three times. Even when we doubt, Maybe you don't doubt that Jesus is real. Maybe you don't doubt that God exists. Maybe you just doubt that He can do something about it or that He actually wants to. Maybe you doubt that you have access to the power that can make this possible for you and for others. Maybe we as a church have become so caught up in the effects of all that's happening in 2020 and what it's done to us and what it may do and how that may change what we've enjoyed in the past. Maybe we as a church have forgotten the power that is available. The promise that still stands. When 
we sing, he breaks every chain. I can't help but wonder. These kind of chains, this is not figurative or metaphorical. This is real. Can he break these kind of chains? Can he break the chains in you that won't let, that won't let go? Can he defeat the obstacles you can't seem to overcome relationally? Economically? Physically? Emotionally? Can he break those chains? Can he break the chains that hold on to you in your spirit that keep you down and depressed and not embracing the power he's made available to help change the world? Is this too pie in the sky? Or is it real? These chains are real, I can tell you. And I look you in the eyes as many as I can see. And I tell you that while I've not mastered it, and I'm still learning it myself, He can. And He does. We're called to be persistent. And when he does, we should celebrate because it's no small weight taken off of us. The power of Jesus' name. We're set free and given the opportunity to bless others. Not in our power, not in our name, not because of the wisdom that we've gained, not because of the skill and talent we've developed, but because of one who has overcome all that is to be overcome. And that promises that if His church will rise up, and put our full dependence and faith in Him and call on Him for every need and continue to call on Him for every need. He will set us free and give us the ability to rejoice even in our suffering. Lord Jesus.